Hello everyone and welcome to Music Theory with Gim. In this installment of Analyzing a Melody, we're going to be delving into Gloomy Memories from Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow on the Nintendo DS. Before we get into any music theory, however, let's take a listen to the music. The theme is set in the tonality of C, with its mode being minor. In the first six measures, we have harmonically C minor, the 1, G7 over B, the 5, 6, 5, and then E diminished over B flat, which is a chromatic chord used for the sake of intensifying motion forward to the following chord, F minor over A flat, the 4, 6. With the preceding G7 over B, E diminished over B flat can certainly be analyzed as a substitution or rather an incomplete C7 over B flat, the 5, 4, 2 of 4, but I view it as simply a 7 diminished 4, 3 relative to 4. After hearing F minor over A flat, the chord becomes F minor 7, the 4, 7, which then leads to G7, the 5, 7, ending the phrase with a half cadence. This progression is then repeated, only now we hear it with the addition of two measures at the end. These measures consist of F minor, the 4, and G7, the 5, 7, and they are used to prolong or extend the preceding half cadence. In the final phrase, we hear C minor, the 1, B diminished over D, the 7 diminished 6, and C minor over E flat, the 1 6, which then transforms into C7 over E. Like E diminished over B flat, this chromatic chord is operating as a means to intensify forward motion to F minor, the 4, and can be viewed as a 5 6 5 of 4. Following the ascent to F minor, we hear an incomplete F sharp diminished 7, which is another chromatic chord used for, again, the sake of intensification, only this time it is directed towards G major, the 5. As a result, we can view F sharp diminished 7 as a 7 diminished 7 of 5. Upon arriving to G major, we sit on it for two measures and hear, yet again, another half cadence. Only this one brings the theme to a close. Now that we have at least a surface understanding of what is happening harmonically, let's move on to the analysis of the melody, which, for the sake of clarity, has been extracted from the full score. In the first six measures, the core idea is C descending to B natural. In the first embellishing layer, we hear an ascending line constructed with conjunct motion. Upon reaching A flat, however, the ascent is backtracked entirely, descending directly to B natural. So the melody basically leaves C and then returns to it just before reaching the final tone, B natural. The next layer of embellishments provides measures 1 through 4 additional notes. These notes embellish the ascending conjunct line with lower neighbor tones that are all a semitone below the structural note of the measure. Once the structural tone is returned to, the melody then leaps a minor third above before moving to the next structural tone. For example, C in the first measure is embellished by a step to and from B natural and then by a leap to E flat before ascending structurally to D. In measure 4, however, the leap of a minor third from F is replaced by ascending stepwise motion to G, which is done for the sake of delaying the arrival of A-flat until the following measure. With this layer added, we can also see a series of unfolding thirds which are commonly used to embellish an ascending or descending line. A 
as mentioned before, the second phrase is a repeat of the first, only now we have the addition of two measures. In these two measures, we hear basically a contracted and unembellished form of the core idea, which is C descending to B, only C is accompanied by F minor and not C minor. After descending to B, the melody is embellished by a leap to G, followed by steps to and from F. This is done to transfer the melody to an upper voice so that it can smoothly begin on E flat rather than having to leap directly to it from the leading tone B. In the third and final phrase, the core idea is very similar to what we have already seen, only rather than hear C descend to B, it is now E flat descending to D. In the first embellishing layer, we hear E flat ascend by step to G, and then from G descend to D. Notice how, again, the first structural note is the penultimate note, meaning we leave it and then return to it before moving on to the final structural tone of the phrase. In the second embellishing layer, we have additional notes appearing in the second, third, and fourth measures of the phrase. In the second measure, G ascends by fourth to C, and then descends by step to F. Due to the quarter note rhythm, the return to G occurs on beat 1 of the third measure, creating a 9-8 suspension, delaying the arrival of F until beat 2 of the third measure. Upon arriving to F, we hear it embellished by a leap to and from A flat. Lastly, in the fourth measure, we hear E flat embellished by both its lower and upper neighbor tones, D and F, in that order. The presence of D will most likely push some to want to refer to this measure as D7 flat 9 over F sharp. This is certainly an acceptable interpretation, but I view it as F sharp diminished 7. Anyways, make note that F natural forms a cross relation with F sharp. Though F can be respelled as E sharp, showing its local relation as a major 7th of F sharp, the spelling of F better demonstrates its link to the underlying tonality of C. In my opinion, this often outweighs the local value, but it's certainly worth considering both options. And be certain to make note that these types of cross relations are very common when the note in question is the result of an embellishment, such as F being an upper neighbor tone of E flat. Now that we have an understanding of the melody measure to measure in each section, let's take a look at the melody on a global scale. The first two phrases of the theme are essentially C minor progressing to G7 with the melody being structurally C descending to B. This is again performed twice with the second playthrough receiving the extension of two measures. These measures, however, do not change anything fundamentally and that is why the two phrases have been compressed to only a single phrase during this global view. And then we have the final phrase, which is C minor progressing to G major, with E flat descending to D in the melody. As we already know, these core ideas are expanded by interposing tones that lead us away from the initial structural tones, but ultimately bring us back to them before descending to the final tone. In the first two phrases, this means C moving to and from A flat, and E flat moving to and from G in the final phrase. Now that we have an understanding of the theme's melody, both locally and globally, we're ready to take another listen to Gloomy Memories. Before listening, however, I do want to mention two more things. The first of these is regarding the melody and how, in its final state with all of its embellishments, the apex of each phrase is similar yet contrasting. In the first two phrases, the apex is A-flat and occurs near the end of the phrase. In relation to the starting and ending points, this forms an ascending sixth and descending seventh. In the final phrase, the apex is C, which in relation to the starting and ending notes, forms an ascending sixth and descending seventh, the same as the previously shown phrase. This time, however, the apex occurs in the beginning portion of the phrase rather than the ending. 
The second thing to look out for is the base motion, which is designed to head primarily in a single direction regarding its structural design. In the first two phrases, the base is built heavily around descending motion, with ascending motion occurring structurally only when f ascends to g. The final phrase, however, is designed entirely with ascending motion. And I mention the bass line not only to show how they contrast one another, but to show how they contrast the melody which forms a rising and falling arc. Anyways, with these ideas in mind as well as the rest of the analysis, let's take another listen to the theme and then bring this episode to a close. For those of you that are patrons, you can expect to receive a PDF containing the analysis present in this episode. I do not expect to make any additional commentaries on this particular piece, but if I do, you'll certainly gain access to those as well. Of course, as my patrons, it is encouraged that, should you have any thoughts or questions regarding this analysis or the theme as a whole, reach out to me. For those of you that are not patrons but like to support my endeavors, be certain to subscribe to the channel and click the notifications bell, like the video, comment below, and share the video as often as you can on social media platforms. If you find yourself wanting to take your support to the next level, hop on over to patreon.com forward slash gem and consider pledging some coin. If you are not a user of Patreon or simply want to make a non-recurring financial contribution, you can do so at coffee.com forward slash music theory with gem. These videos do take a lot of time and effort, so any support on your end is greatly appreciated. Either way, until next time, thank you for watching this episode of Music Theory with Gim.